driver's license training. Uh, we're starting on chapter three in your driver's guidebook, if you're following along, and that starts on page number 43. So this is all about the basics of driving. And this starts from when you first get in your vehicle um, and how you would wanna, we're gonna talk a little bit about the controls and seating position, wearing seat belts, those sort of things. So before you even start moving the vehicle, we're gonna first talk about getting in the vehicle, setting it up, um, setting it up in to be safe for you. And then we'll go into the basics of driving, like it says, like starting, stopping, reversing, just some, some basic maneuvers to build up to um, more advanced. So starting with a video, takes a second to load. Oh, I just gotta make sure that you guys can hear it. One sec. There we go. Okay. So this is all about once you get in the vehicle, uh, before you start going. Adjusting the driver's seat properly isn't just for comfort, it's for your teen's safety. The seat needs to be adjusted properly so your Uh-oh. Sorry. Try that again. Adjusting the driver's seat properly isn't just for comfort, it's for your teen's safety. The seat needs to be adjusted properly so your teen can easily reach the gas and brake pedals and the other controls of the car. If the seat is adjusted well, they should also have a clear view of the entire landscape out the windshield. Also, the head rest, as it's often called, is actually a safety device known as a head restraint. The top of the head restraint should be about three inches below the top of the head. The distance behind the head should be as small as possible. A well-adjusted head restraint can help minimize injuries in the event of a crash. This activity happens with your car parked in your driveway out of traffic. First, have your teen adjust the seat so their stomach is 10 inches from the steering wheel with both hands on the wheel at 9 and 3 o'clock position. Their back should be in contact with the seat back. This gives your teen the optimum position for car control. Next, have your teen put the ball of their foot on the brake pedal. Make sure your teen can fully push down on the brake without lifting the heel of the foot they should be able to easily switch their foot over to the gas pedal. When they feel their seat is fully adjusted, ask your teen if they feel comfortable. If they aren't, adjust the seat a little more. Otherwise, they'll be distracted, and that's never a good way to drive. You'll know when your teen understands this lesson when they reach to adjust their seat without a reminder from you. Okay, so... In that video, it talked about a few things, um, your seat position um, and your head restraint. Um, so you definitely want it, your head restraint in the right position because it reduces the risk of whiplash and injuries. So in case you get rear-ended in a collision, um, your head flies back and that head restraint will help to ensure that you don't have any additional in injuries or make it worse. So. As the video kind of demonstrated, you want the middle of the head restraint to be in line with the middle of your head. That's the ideal position. So pay attention to that. Even if you're a passenger um, and you're in another person's vehicle and you get in that passenger side seat, it is helpful or um, to have it in the right position because it can it can actually save you a lot of um, pain and heartache down the road if if you were to get into a collision. It can save you and keep your neck and everything in a good position. So. Center of the head restraint is level with the top of your ears. Um, decrease the space between your head and the restraint, so less than 10 centimeters. You don't want to be, you don't want your seat way back, kind of low riding, <laughs> and because then there's a greater distance for um, your head to hit the seat. The closer it is, the safer it is. Um, passengers' head restraints are adjusted to the correct height. Yeah. 
also, yeah, it's saying even as passengers. So the driver is really important to have your head like that, but also for your passengers, it's important to keep it like that. So before you even start driving, as the video talked about, was adjusting your seat properly so that you can reach the pedals um, comfortably. Um, you don't want to be so close that you're touching the steering wheel or anything like that, um, but far enough back, but your toes should, or your full, your full foot, the ball of your feet should be able to touch the pedals nice and easily. Um, you can see over the steering wheel, obviously. So some, some especially newer vehicles, you can lift the seat up and down for to dependent on your height. Make sure you can clearly see over the dashboard and all of your um, windshield. Position the back of the at least twenty. Oh, sorry. So position yourself in the seat at least it talked about 10 inches away from the steering wheel or 25 centimeters. In Canada, we usually use centimeters as a, but it could, it could be either or on the test. They could, they will likely say 25 centimeters, but you could also see them referencing it to 10 inches. What I also use to as like a good measure, just when you're, when you're in a car, you don't usually have a measure tape with you unless you're like a contractor. But um, if you, if you space out your hands, like this, nice and straight. And that is a good distance. That's usually about 10 inches or 25 centimeters from the steering wheel. And the reason why you wanna be that far from the steering wheel is because of airbags. Um, if you're really, really close and you were to get into a collision and your airbags go off, um, they are really fast. They come with, out within um, you know fractions of a second. However, if you're that close, you may not, the airbag might not deploy fast enough to actually um, save and cushion the blow for you. So that's the main reason why you want to be farther back is uh, for your safety for the airbag. So they have enough time to deploy and save you potentially from hitting that steering wheel and getting more um, severe injuries. You also want your, that gives you a good distance to have your arms. Um, in like a comfortable position. You don't want your arms straight um, forward on the steering wheel. You want a little bit of a bend so it's a little bit comfortable. Um, so that's usually the ideal uh, distance. You must be able to reach the brake pedal, um, but also the gas pedal. You need both pedals. And if you're in a standard, there would also be a clutch pedal. So you'd need both feet to comfortably reach those pedals. You don't want to be stretching for it because you don't want to be in a position where you're um, stretching to get that break. And you don't want to be too close so that you're hammering on that gas too quickly either. So those are all um, kind of the pre-driving basics that it goes through on page 44 and 45. Um, but you also need to adjust your mirrors. Um, so both your rear view mirror, when you adjust your rear view mirror, you should see the full back window behind you. So just adjust that to higher or lower, whichever you need to fit the angle of when you're looking in your rear view mirror and also your side view mirrors. Um, you want to be able to see a little bit of this of your vehicle, the side of your vehicle, and then most of the road beside you and behind you. So those you adjust those mirrors to reduce your blind spot. And we'll talk more about what a blind spot is. Um, adjusting your inside rear view mirror so you can see as much as possible behind you, uh, making sure you see that whole window, um, and your side view mirrors, right, to reduce your blind spots. I said that. Um, your, and then making sure that your seat belt is done up. Obviously, we're, um, there's been a lot of public campaigns about using your seat belt and that it saves lives. Um, can also re greatly decrease your um, chances of being injured. Um, it's also the law. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, police enforcement and um, enhancement to make sure that you use your seatbelt. If you're caught without a seatbelt, it can uh, result in a fine, but it's also just very, very important to your safety. Um, and a lot of people nowadays have just, it's become common practice to use that seatbelt because we know that it can have a big impact and difference in saving somebody's life or um, decreasing the injury from and the reason why seat belts are there as well um, in case there was an incident where you were in a really bad collision and if you were 
say hit a moose or if the car rolls over sometimes um, it can keep you in this vehicle you in the seat is usually the safest position for you to be in because once you kind of if you were to fly through the car through the windshield or something like that be lodged from the car you never know where you could actually end up or the car could end up on top of you something like that so the the safest position even even though it may not feel like it when you're strapped to a car if you're in a collision it can be scary um, it usually is the safest place for you to be in that seat with a seatbelt Um, yep, wear those seatbelts, they're the law. So now you're all strapped in, you're in your vehicle and you're nice and everything's adjusted to the way it should be for you. Um, everything feels comfortable as well. You should never be stretched or feeling, um, could be because driving should feel comfortable. You don't want it to be uncomfortable or um, straining or hurting you or anything like that. So. Um, because sometimes you can be driving for long distances, you wanna make sure you're comfortable and everything feels normal and, and good. So once you're in that car, we're gonna talk about, before I even take off, one of the big skills um, that new drivers need to consider um, is stopping and how long it actually takes for you to stop your vehicle. There are certain things that go in to stopping a vehicle and it takes a little bit of um, practice to, to see good judgment and, and realize how much you, room you need to stop your vehicle. But we're gonna go into what are the things that affect a stopping time and distance, the distance that it takes you to stop your car. There are several factors that affect braking distance. Perception distance is how far your vehicle travels from the time you see a hazard until your brain registers it in ideal conditions. Perception distance can be affected by mental and physical conditions, medication, visibility, or the hazard itself. Reaction distance is how far you continue traveling after seeing a hazard and hitting the brakes. The average perception and reaction time is three fourths of a second to one second each. At 50 miles per hour, that is 55 feet of travel for perception and another 55 feet for reaction. If you are distracted, your perception and reaction time can increase dramatically. So you should always keep your attention on driving. So with stopping, few drivers know how much time or distance it takes to fully stop your vehicle, especially as a new driver. Um, so as a result, they may make errors in judgment and could lead to a collision if you're not um, stopping or applying that brake early enough and giving yourself enough time to get your vehicle into a full stop. Um, and this is uh, starts on page 50. If you flip to page 50 of your driver's guide, um, there's a good chart down there and it highlights the different, the three main factors that contribute to it. And in the video, he talked about perception time. So that's the first one. That perception time is how long it takes for your brain to recognize the situation, understand that you need to stop. So in the image here on the slide, um, those vehicles are the, the, the split second, it takes about three quarters of a second, I believe. Yeah, it takes about three quarters. So less than a second it takes for your brain to realize, oh, there's a truck up ahead, I need to start stopping. But within that three quarters of a second, your vehicle could have traveled a certain amount of distance depending on your speed. So just remember, perception is how long it takes you to recognize that you need to stop or make a change or an adjustment to your vehicle. And as he had mentioned, um, your perception time can be affected by a lot of different things. How your level of attention, um, like if you're really paying attention to the road, if you're a little bit distracted. I know that I have a little one um, in the back seat, and sometimes when she's making noise or crying or something like that, that can definitely take my attention off of the road sometimes. So um, if you have other passengers in the vehicle that are talking to you, that sort of thing, if you're kind of adjusting the radio, of course. Cell phone use is not um, prohibited when you're driving a vehicle because that definitely takes your attention off of the road. So 
the level of attention that you're paying to your to the road can really impact how quickly you react to something. Um, also, um, your decision making capability. I mean, when you're a new driver, um, you're often not as confident or you second guess yourself a little bit. So that second of you like, should I stop? Should I? Shouldn't I? That can impact the time of when you start applying the brake. Um, the experience of the driver, of course, um, sometimes even proactive driving when you're looking ahead and if you see say you saw that truck down the road before it even got in front of you and you started applying that brake way earlier because you knew that truck was coming by the speed that they were coming at um, so you were already well in advance and prepared to stop so that can have a big difference too of the experience of the driver usually um, the more experience you have you can actually start to assess um, the other drivers around you in the environment that you're in and you can usually start to predict what other drivers are going to do um, the degree of fatigue, so how tired you are, can definitely make a big difference on the perception time. Um, if you've had a lot of coffee or you're, like, especially if you're night driving um, and your eyes start getting sore, that can definitely impact how your perception time. Um, also, use of alcohol or drugs or even, like, not even illegal drugs, even prescription drugs. There are some prescription drugs out there that can make you drowsy and can have an impact on how quickly you can perceive. So we had a couple people join us. Um, we're starting, we're on page 50 right now of the driver's guide. And we're talking about the three main factors that add up into your total stopping time of a vehicle. So the second factor that plays into this is your reaction time. And the reaction time is the time that it takes you to physically react to that danger of a moving of or get your body to react to the fact that you need to start applying the brake so like it says there you, when you physically move your foot from the gas pedal to the brake pedal that can take three quarters of a second so your your perception time was your brain realizing you need to stop the reaction time is your body physically responding by moving your foot off of the gas onto the brake and that can take three quarters of a second as well. So now we're up to what a second and a half, but depending on your speed, your vehicle could have traveled um, quite far in that time. And that's also why you don't follow too closely. Like in this vehicle, um, he's really close up against that other vehicle in front of him. And if that vehicle in front of him were to slam on the brakes really quickly because say an animal jumps out, looks like they're on a highway or something like that. And if they're going at 100 kilometers an hour on a primary highway, he would not have enough time to stop his vehicle because the vehicle in front of him is already a few seconds ahead where they saw the danger, they applied the brake, they perceived it, they reacted to it. And now the guy behind him, he only started realizing he needed to brake once he saw those brake lights in front of him. By that point, it's usually too late. Um, by the time he moves his foot over, he's gonna end up hitting that vehicle because he's so close. And the last thing that goes in, the last factor that goes into your total stopping distance is your braking time. So that's how long it takes for the vehicle to come to a complete stop. So, so this can actually, this is usually the longest time of your braking time uh, or of your total stopping time is the getting your vehicle from the, the momentum that it has and the velocity um, and especially heavier trucks. If you're in a bigger, heavier truck, you, def you need more stopping time versus like a small little car, a race car. Those can stop a lot quicker um, and with less distance than a big truck because that all depends on how heavy you are, how fast you're going and your reaction to it. So um, the distance traveled in this time is called the braking distance, but all of those factors together, your perception time, number one, your reaction time and the braking time, when you add all of those distances together, it will equal your total stopping distance. And as we can see um, on the little, this chart is in your driver's guide, it shows you that that bar 
is the total stopping time for your vehicle at different speeds. So the yellow is your perception time, the blue is your reaction time, and the red is your stop, your braking distance. So you can see the red is definitely the longest time frame, but it, it increases the faster you're going. Um, so at 30 kilometers an hour, you can, because you're going so slow in your vehicle, you can stop pretty, pretty quickly and with less distance. But as you go up into 50, 80, 100, 110, that stopping distance greatly increases um, because how fast you're going plays into a big part of how, how fast you can stop. So, and there's also additional factors. Um, as the guy in the video said, that's under ideal road condition. So say you're in a situation where the condition of the roadway is not ideal, like snow, um, rain, sleet, ice even. Sometimes you don't even see the ice. Like if it's raining and it's a little chilly that day, it's not winter, but say you're going into fall and all of a sudden there's some ice on the road you didn't know because yesterday it was clear and fine. That can play into a big factor into how fast you can stop. Also, your level of alertness, as I kind of talked about already, um, how much attention you're paying to the road, how tired you are, those play, those can definitely adjust how how long it takes you to stop. Um, your vehicle, um, definitely newer vehicles with like fresh new brakes and fresh new tires, um, they can stop a lot quicker than um, vehicles that may have less tread, so they have less grip on their tires. Um, they have maybe your brakes have need to get fixed so the tension on them is a little loose and they're not stopping the way that they used to so that can you need to kind of fact you need to pay attention to all those factors that play into your vehicle in your situation um, the vehicle speed as I had mentioned and on that chart um, the faster you're going the more distance you need to stop um, condition of your vehicle's brakes and tires, like I mentioned. And all of these factors work in combination to determine your stopping time and distance. So um, on a regular nice sunny day, when you're driving around, your stopping distance could be whatever it is for that time. Um, it's not so bad. But then another, the, the next day you're going out there and the road conditions aren't so good and and your tires are getting a little worn out or something like that. And then you realize um, you tried to stop that same amount of distance, but it didn't, your car didn't react as um, good as it did before. So then you'll realize, oh no, I definitely need to adjust to that and I need to start braking sooner. So all of those things play into your stopping distance. And it's really important to keep people safe. Like I said, for rear ending people, for stopping for progestin, pedestrians and for your own safety in your own vehicle you don't want to get into a collision because that creates a heart a lot of headache so as a driver you must attempt to adjust to or modify for these factors to avoid a collision braking techniques so um, there are a few different main braking techniques um, that people most drivers go to um, when coming to a stop you must begin braking early like i said and do not leave braking too late of course uh, because then you're in a scary situation where you're trying to lock your you're trying to stop your vehicle really quickly um, so it's always just better to um, be prepared to stop earlier it's always it, you can always speed up if you need to but it's a lot harder to slow down when you're already in a situation where you're coming up to an intersection or something like that ease off so when you are intending to brake you ease off the accelerator um, or that's another word for a gas pedal your gas pedal is your accelerator so ease up on that in advance apply that brake to reduce your speed um, and it's always better even if you don't know if you're going to stop yet say you're coming up to a yield sign where you're like you see that yield sign you know you got to slow down a little bit you might have to stop or you might not you still want to slow your vehicle down to put yourself in the best position to come to a stop if you if you need to right say there's a there's a kid uh, just around the block and he's hidden behind a fence or a tree and you can't see him but you're coming up as long as you're approaching that intersection nice and slow um, 
say that kid ends up running out, you're in the best position to stop quickly because you're slowing down. You're already prepared to stop versus um, just flying through that intersection um, and then trying to stop an emergency situation. To brake smoothly, you ease off on the brake pedal slightly and then reapply pressure on the pedal just before you come to a stop. So um, you'll notice once you start practicing driving, um, you have to really feel out the vehicle's brakes. They all react a little bit differently. Um, but to put that brake pedal on, you wanna, you, you definitely don't wanna just slam it right to the, to the floor um, because you're gonna end up uh, jerking your car a little bit and it's usually not the smoothest way to do things. So what you do with your brake is you apply some pressure, take your foot off a little bit and adjust to make sure that your vehicle slowly um, reducing its speed and then eventually come to a nice stop. Um, also, if you slam on that brake really quickly and you got some passengers, um, you know, they're going to get jerked around and um, could just be for an unpleasant uh, drive. But it just takes practice of feeling out that vehicle and seeing how it reacts to the brake. So as you can see in the image, um, that's your ideal foot position. You wouldn't have your full foot on it. You usually use the top or the balls of your feet um, to apply the pressure and that has, um, that's the, and then you would have your heel on the, on the floor as you apply that brake and use your, use your foot kind of as a little lever as you're pushing on that brake. So another technique for braking, that's just generally when you're in a good situation and you just have to come to a normal stop, but there's situations where you might be in like an emergency, like I said, you need to respond quickly. Um, so one technique is threshold braking. And threshold braking basically means that you would wanna use that when you need to stop quickly. And it means that you put the maximum amount of pressure onto the brake but not too much that it locks your brakes or locks your wheels up. So I'm gonna, that's easier. It's easier to visualize what a threshold braking technique looks like versus just explaining it. So I'm gonna switch over to a quick little video um, to show the technique of threshold braking. Oh, we got a chat too. Okay. This is a tomato. Oh, Think it's good for ad. you. Sorry, guys. Think again. All right, so threshold breaking. What's threshold braking? Threshold braking is the maximum amount of brake pressure that you can use before the tires lock up. We're driving around today in this little Subaru with the ABS disconnected because we can stop much, much faster on snow and ice. If you've been following this channel for any period of time or you've driven in the winter, you probably know that ABS is pretty bad on snow and ice. So we've disconnected it. But if you have it in your streetcar, threshold braking is just braking up to that point where the pedal starts to go and then backing off and trying again and trying to avoid that pedal chatter so much. So if you want to practice threshold braking, all you need to do is find a relatively safe place to do it. This could be, you know, a deserted back road, nobody behind you, you can see what's going on. And all you really need to do is start building up brake pressure and building up brake pressure until you can feel the tires want to lock up and then just back off a little and make micro adjustments essentially to find that sweet spot where you get the best possible deceleration from your car. If you go a little too hard on the brakes, you push a little too far, the wheels are gonna lock up. And when the wheels lock up, two things are gonna happen. One, the car's gonna get into a skid. It's gonna start to understeer if you have any steering in. And two, on a hard surface, you're actually just gonna stop decelerating as well. As you start braking, you'll feel the car slowing down and slowing down better and better until you lock the brakes up, and then it kind of stops slowing down and just gets into a skid. So on pavement, on ice, on hard surfaces, you know, two-dimensional surfaces, you don't want to lock the brakes up. You want to threshold brake and use all of that available grip. 
on three-dimensional surfaces. You know, if you got an inch of snow on top of pavement, locking the tires up can help you. If you're in the mud, locking the tires up can help you. In the sand, anything like that, you'll stop much faster by digging in. But that's a judgment call you need to make in the moment, just analyzing the grip you got, feeling when you get on the brakes, how well that's working for you. And if the tires lock up and you start decelerating even better, then roll with that. So that's just something to get used to on different surfaces as you're practicing. And the nice thing about threshold braking is you avoid the skidding. No matter what surface you're on, if you threshold brake and you get the most braking you can without locking the wheels up, the car stays nice and stable. And in your car, if that threshold brake is, you know, 72 percent brake pressure, you got to know right where that sweet spot is or right about there and get as close as you can kind of quickly. So, switch back to our PowerPoint. As you can see with that threshold braking, it's just applying enough pressure um, before it locks up your wheels. Um, because the reason why you don't want to lock up your wheels, essentially, like he said, it depends on different. Can you guys see that? You guys can see the presentation still? Hopefully. Yeah, it's good. Okay, thanks. It was just giving me a warning, so. Um, where was I? The, so yeah, you don't wanna lock up your tires. Um, like you said, sometimes maybe in mud or snow, that might be good, but for the most part, you wanna have complete control of your vehicle. And if um, you lock up your tires by slamming on that brake too quickly, um, and you need to actually steer away from something, that's not a good, situation. If you apply that brake too quickly, you're not going to be able to actually move your tires. Um, so it's fine if there's nothing in front of you and you just need to stop really quickly, but sometimes you might have to avoid like an animal or something like that, or, you know, swerve away from another vehicle that's in front of you, something like that. So the threshold braking is usually the best technique in every situation because you're, you're applying enough solid pressure to bring your vehicle to a stop, but not so hard that you end up losing that control of your vehicle and so there's also we'll talk more about other vehicles that are equipped with the anti-lock brake system so he was referencing that in the video he kept saying you're he disenabled his abs um you wouldn't want to do that like most newer vehicles are equipped with an anti-lock braking system so that say you did need to slam on that brake really hard usually um, newer vehicles will still allow you to have that control with their anti-lock brake system um, but sometimes older vehicles um, they don't they're not equipped with that abs system um, so you definitely it's always helpful to also maybe look at your vehicle's owner manual and see if it does come equipped with an abs because that can really contribute to um, you having to make those split second decisions of your vehicle and what's the best braking technique to use for your vehicle. Okay, so enough on uh, stopping. I think you guys have got that one down. So the next um, skill with your vehicle is reversing and backing up. So reversing is definitely not um, like an intuitive sort of thing um, because it's really hard to see behind your vehicle. So first you, when you're backing up in a straight line, the techniques that they use is you place your left hand on the top of the steering wheel. Um, so every other situation when you're steering and turning and driving straight, you always want to have two hands on the steering wheel at all times. Um, the only exception to this is if you're in a standard and you need to take your hand off to shift, but then you bring your hand back on the steering wheel, um, or if you're reversing. So with reversing, it helps to have one hand on the top of your steering wheel, and then you look over, you would put your other hand kind of beside the passenger chair, 
her seat and you would look over your shoulder through the back window. Um, so why would you want to look out your back window instead of just using your rear view mirror? It's because you guys have probably seen um, most mirrors say objects may appear or may be closer than they appear. So when you're looking through a mirror, it does distort the perception a little bit of an object. So um, because you're kind of looking through a reflection, that object or that car in the mirror could seem farther away than it actually is. So that's why you want to actually not use depend on your mirrors as much. What you would do in a reversing situation, you would look at your mirrors um, just as a glance, like it says here. Um, but you always, your main focus should be looking directly through your window because that gives you the best perception of how close other, other objects or vehicles are. And then you would just glance maybe to the front to see, make sure that the front of your vehicle is still okay and clear as you're making movements. And maybe just check, you would check your side views, your side view mirrors, just to make sure that you're not getting close to any other objects. Um, and then to make slight steering corrections, you would just turn that steering wheel in the same direction that you want your, the back of your vehicle to go. So because it's a little bit reversed from when you're, when you're going forward, you just steer where you want to go. Um, when you're looking back, wherever you want the back of your vehicle to go, you push to. So if you want the back of your vehicle to go right, you would steer right because it puts your front wheels in a position to move your vehicle in that position. So we'll look a little bit more about that when we talk about parking in a minute. So see how um, this guy, he's looking through his back window versus relying on the mirror. That's, that's just number one thing when you're reversing. A really good thing to remember is always look right through your window and apply it. And if you can't see through your window, um, and you have to rely on your um, side view mirrors, then you, in that situation, you would want somebody to assist you. That's when you would have somebody out there judging that space cushion because um, definitely when you look in those tiny little mirrors, um, objects seem smaller in the mirror. So then that distance, they seem farther away. That's just the way it works in mirrors and you don't wanna rely on that because it's not a true, um, it's not a true judgment of how close or how far things are. So if you had to, um, always use your back window, but in a situation where you can't see through it, say there's some cargo or you have a trailer behind you, something like that, then get somebody to assist you to make sure you're not gonna bump into anything. So when backing to the left or the right, use both hands on the steering wheel in this situation. So you're not just backing straight up anymore, you actually are maneuvering your vehicle. So anytime you're gonna turn your vehicle in, um, you want to have both hands on the steering wheel because just in an instance where you start turning your vehicle and you only have one hand, as soon as you take that hand off, your vehicle's gonna naturally wanna come back to the starting position um, with that tension. It's, it's not natural for the tires to be turned. Um, they don't just, stay there easily they always your your tires want to default to going back straight so that's why anytime you're going to turn your vehicle you definitely want to keep two hands on them to back to the left you look over your left shoulder with occasional glasses to the front and then vice versa when you're trying to move your vehicle to the right you would look over your right shoulder so this is essentially um, also what a shoulder check is. Anytime that you want to do a lane change or you're backing, reversing your vehicle, you want to rely by looking over that shoulder in that direction. So the reason why you would, if you're moving to the left, you would look over your left shoulder so that you can see the best possible view of what's on your left side of your car. Um, because if you're looking just on the right and you're trying to go left, there's a, there's a big part back there that you cannot see. just as the individual in there, she is looking over her left shoulder as she's reversing. And that's because she's checking the left side of her vehicle as she moves that way. She should also have two hands on the wheel, <laughs> as we discussed. Remember, um, 
the front of your vehicle will actually swing in the opposite direction that you're turning. So if you are turning your vehicle, your back end's going left, then the front end's going to be going right. So that's why you need to kind of keep making glances to the front, making sure that the front of your vehicle isn't going to hit like a parked car beside you or something like that. So parallel parking. Um, when you're parallel parking, um, you always want to check clearly. Well, basically what parallel um, means is side by side. So there's also a term called double parking. Double parking is when you pull up beside a vehicle and you guys are parked right side by side, one after the other. Um, but on like a residential street or a main road, you are not allowed to double park. You can't just pull up beside you know, another vehicle, you know, door to door, because you're going to be obstructing traffic. So what you need to do is come up to that vehicle and then either park in front or behind him parallel running where you guys are in a single file. That's what parallel parking means. Um, it doesn't mean that you're right beside it together. It means that you're kind of, you're behind it and you're, you guys are in a straight row together. So parallel parking is a maneuver that requires multiple driving skills. You need to use signaling, you need to use braking, and you need to use reversing, you need to use good judgment um, and use of your side view mirrors and looking through your back and good calm vehicle control. So I think that's why people think parallel parking is a little challenging um, because you are you have to use every skill, every driving skill you have in order to safely and um, effectively parallel park. And people just get freaked out by it, I think, because <laughs> um, you get really close to the other vehicles as you're parallel parking and it's not a very natural movement for your vehicle. So um, and it takes a lot of turning the wheel. So you always check early in your rear view. So as you're coming to planning to parallel park, you look through your rear view mirror and see if there's anybody behind you. If there's somebody following you really closely and you're intending to stop right away, um, you, you definitely want to prepare yourself so that you're not, you're in a situation where there's vehicles behind you that they have enough time to stop safely. You apply your brake well in advance and you start to slow down, but you would also signal to let drivers know behind you that you intend to park. Um, stop when the rear bumper of your vehicle is in line with the rear bumper of vehicle B. So this um, just shows you the steps. And this is on page 52 of your driver's guide. This shows you each, there's like four, one, two, three, four, four or five main steps to parallel parking. As you can see, as the you pull up beside them. So the first image at the very top where that vehicle is right beside the other one, that's double parking. That's a term that you might see where it'll ask if you're allowed to double park. You are never allowed to double park um, on a road. Um, it just doesn't make sense. That's why you would see parking lots are designed to have vehicles side by side, but you would never want to do that on a residential or urban road. And then you can see the vehicle A is reversing a little bit and it's swinging its tires to the right or it's steering to the right so that the right side of the vehicle is moving in. And then it backs, reverses straight into the spot and then it adjusts, you turn your wheel to the left side so that your vehicle's back end starts moving left into the spot and then you pull ahead so you're in a nice little position. So um, again, I think that driving is a lot easier to visualize than to discuss it. So I have a video that shows these steps of how to parallel park and what not to do when you're parallel parking. Parallel parking requires practice. You must also learn to judge if a parking space is large enough for your vehicle. Some common mistakes when parallel parking are backing too quickly and not turning the wheel at the appropriate time, therefore failing to enter the parking space properly.
making too wide of an angle when backing into the space thereby hitting the curb. Not backing in far enough and therefore being too far from the curb. The correct approach to parallel parking is to stop when the rear bumper of your vehicle is in line with the rear bumper of the front vehicle. Be sure to leave about one meter of space between the vehicles. Then back very slowly while steering sharply to the right until the vehicle is at approximately 45 degree angle with the curb. Straighten your wheels and continue backing until the right end of your front bumper is in line with the back end of the front vehicle. Turn the wheel sharply to the left as far as it will go and back up until your vehicle is parallel with the curb. Move forward slowly while straightening your wheels and center your vehicle between the two parked vehicles. A common mistake when exiting a parallel parking space is not signaling your intentions to leave and not checking for traffic, thereby causing a collision. The correct approach to exit a parallel parking space is to first back your vehicle to make more room for exiting, then move very slowly forward while steering to the left to preposition the wheels, check for traffic, signal left, shoulder check, and exit when safe. So there you go. Those were some do's and don'ts of parallel parking and just the visualization of uh, what a parallel park looks like. Um, he also mentioned being too far away from the curb. So one um, good tip to remember is that vehicles need to be 50 centimeters within 50 centimeters of a curb. And that's usually about a foot, um, just to imagine in your mind, but um, they very well could ask you on the test um, how close or how, how far, how close does your vehicle need to be from the curb? And it needs to be within 50 centimeters of each other. Also for the, the road test, when you're actually driving the vehicle with a, an examiner in the car with you, they will ask you to do a parallel park. And that's one of the things that they're gonna judge is one, how well you did your parallel park getting into the vehicle, but how close you are to the curb because you legally need to be within that 50 centimeters. And that's because they don't want your vehicle so far out that you're obstructing traffic. So another type of parking is angle parking. Um, it's not as commonly used anymore as the angle, but what we are, we are used to seeing is angle parking can any, be anywhere from a 90 degree angle like we commonly see in parking lots to a 30 degree angle like here in the image that vehicle um, all those vehicles are set at about 45 to 30 degree angle um, so how those work is these are the following steps that you should be that you should use when you enter an angle parking space. So you're coming up the blue car there. He he's intending to park in that spot. So he would signal that he's intending to turn right into that spot. He would slow down um, and be 30 degrees from the curb. So he needs to be 1.5 meters away from the rear of the vehicles already parked. So he, what that basically means is as he comes into that parking spot, um, he wants to position himself in the middle of the vehicles and make sure that the back of his vehicle is within um, a good range compared to the other vehicles. If he's too far out, um, again, he's gonna be obstructing other vehicles that need to get by. So you wanna get in there nice and snug and close as the curb as possible, but not on the curb. Uh, in a 90 degree angle parking, you must allow about two meters in order to make the sharp turn required. Okay, so he, they're talking about as you're making in, as you're coming into that parking spot, you don't want to be too close to the other vehicles because then you're not giving your vehicle enough room to make the turn smoothly. So you always want to be out a far enough distance that you can um, 
you have enough room to swing your vehicle into that spot. So keep moving slowly forward until the front of your wheels make a light contact with the curb um, or within that 50 centimeters, like I said. So you never really want to like bump the curb though, even in a driver's situation, because um, even when you're taking that road exam, the examiner um, doesn't want you hitting your vehicle with anything. You want to show, demonstrate really good control. So just make sure that your vehicle is within 50 centimeters of the curb um, in front of you on an angle parking. And vehicles should be centered between the two lanes. So in this situation, that vehicle is perfectly centered in that lane. Um, you wouldn't want to be too far over on the right or the left because then you don't give yourself enough room uh, for the other vehicles or you don't give yourself enough room to exit. You need enough room to open your door and safely leave the vehicle or, and not have to bump into other cars. Okay, another parking is hill parking. And um, I know when I took my knowledge exam, this was one of the questions that came up. So they like asking questions about hill parking um, because you need to memorize or visualize how to park on a hill. So if you look here on these situations, um, these are the, the different scenarios that you might find yourself in on a hill. So the first one at the top, is a vehicle where okay where he's facing uphill so just visualize you're in your car you're uphill and there's a curb on the side of you of your hill so the what what you want to do to know which you want to prevent your vehicle from potentially rolling so most of the time we can put on brakes but you don't want to just rely on rely on your brake system um, if an instance where your vehicle um, the brakes didn't work if it's a really steep hill or it's really icy um, you want to put your car into a position when you leave that it's not going to roll out into oncoming traffic so this car um, at the first one at the top we know that if it's facing upwards, it's gonna roll back. And if it's gonna roll back, um, what would we want it to do? We wanna position those tires. We wanna turn them to the right so that if it rolls back, the tires will hit the curb and it'll stop. Um, if you were to do it the other way, left, they'll roll, but then your back tires might hit the curb or you might hit a car that's parked behind you. So the best possible situation is uphill with a curb. You wanna turn your wheels pointing to the left. <laughs> Sorry, I know that there's a lot of words. Um, so I'm trying to help you guys visualize it. So like it says, if you're parking, facing uphill on a street with a curb, turn the wheels towards the left so that your vehicle will roll back and hit the curb. The second situation, if you're parking on a hill facing downwards, but you still have a curb, now think of where your vehicle's gonna roll. It's gonna roll forward. So you wouldn't want your tires to the left because you're gonna roll your vehicle into oncoming traffic. You would wanna, turn your wheels to the right so that your vehicle can roll forward and hit the curb and stop. Um, the third situation is if you're parking uphill without a curb. So think of where your vehicle's gonna roll. If it doesn't have a curb to stop it, um, the best situation if your car is gonna roll back is we want it to roll into the ditch and you know, out of traffic's way. So you turn your wheels facing towards the right so that the right end of your vehicle is going to roll into the ditch and out of traffic. And then the last situation, number four, is if you're, if you're parking facing downwards, again, without a curb, you want to still turn your vehicles left so that even if you roll and that curb's not there to stop you, you're going to roll into the ditch versus rolling out into traffic. So Hopefully you guys get that. You also need to, when you're doing a hill park, you need to set your parking brake. Um, so this is something that we're not, most automatic cars nowadays, we're so used to putting it into the parking gear 
versus driving gear, but we're not so used to using that parking brake. Um, it's also, some people refer to it as an e-brake or an emergency brake. Um, and sometimes they can be located beside um, the driver's side vehicle to easily um, pull it up. But um, in other vehicles, like my vehicle, the, my parking brake is found down below um, with my with some of my gears and it's like a foot brake. I have to push it with my foot. So you definitely again need to pay attention to where the parking brake is equipped on your vehicle and you definitely need to use it in a hill parking situation because um, just having your vehicle in park is usually pretty good on normal flat surfaces but on a hill there's a lot more pressure um, for your vehicle wanting to roll forward. So you need to use that parking brake or that emergency brake and leave it like that. And they will actually watch for that in your road exam as well. Um, we're almost done this chapter, so bear with me. Um, there's also situations when you're parking where you are not allowed to park. Um, so remember yesterday when we were reviewing signs, um, if you see this sign in anywhere around you, it means no parking is permitted. And so um, it can also have different times, like I had mentioned, maybe like the business hours in front of that, they, they want to reserve their parking spots for customers, things like that. So pay attention to that no parking sign um, because you are not allowed to leave your vehicle there even for a couple minutes. Uh, there's a lot of people and sometimes you may even see it with like taxis and things like that. They'll park and they're like, oh, it's just a couple minutes, but that couple minutes can really obstruct um, the other road users. So you gotta pay attention to those no parking signs. But there's a lot of other situations. Sometimes you'll be in situations where there is a no parking sign, but there these situations you need to understand you still cannot park there. Even if there's not a sign prohibiting it, these are the type of situations where you cannot park your vehicle. So you cannot park your vehicle on a sidewalk or boulevard. That's pretty obvious, but um, it may come up as a question on your knowledge exam. Um, you cannot park on a crosswalk or any part of a crosswalk. So, you know, yesterday we were talking about pedestrians um, and sometimes you'll see those crosswalks painted on the road, but sometimes you won't. So you need to understand that you cannot leave your vehicle parked in those crosswalks because then you would be obstructing pedestrians. And just like you can't stop your vehicle in there with, when you're coming up to a stop sign, you need to stop before that crosswalk. You can't leave your vehicle parked there either. Um, you need to, you cannot park within 1.5 meters of access to a garage or a private roadway or an alleyway. So, you know, on residential roads when um, you have houses and then they have a little driveway that comes up either to their property or to their garage. That's what that's talking about. You cannot park within one and a half meters from that driveway. So if you're on a residential road and you're going to go visit somebody and you park in front of their house, you need to make sure you give enough clearance away from their driveway. And that's intended that if there's a vehicle coming out from a driveway, um, that they have enough time to actually turn their vehicle safely into the lane and pull out from their property. If you're parked way too close, they don't have enough room to safely turn and they're going to have to come out a lot farther and then turn um, in, the, in the roadway and potentially cross over with oncoming traffic. So that's so that vehicles can see around you and um, move their vehicle safely out of the driveway. Um, you cannot park within an intersection other than immediately next to the curb of a T intersection. So in the next chapter, we're gonna talk more about different intersections. Um, but general rule of thumb, you cannot park in an intersection, like a four-way intersection. You wouldn't wanna stop your vehicle in there because you got vehicles coming all over in every direction. Um, the only instance where you can park in an intersection is on a T intersection where you're not obstructing, where you're on the side of the road um, where, where there's no vehicles crossing your path. Um, you cannot park within five meters of a stop sign or a yield sign. And so 
always allow yourself enough distance, like the image shows here, there's a stop sign there and you can't leave your vehicle parked within five meters um, of that stop sign. And that's so that other vehicles can see the stop sign well in advance. Like say you're in a lifted truck and you park way too close. Um, other road users won't be able to see that stop sign until it's too late. Um, also gives them enough time that say there was a vehicle coming and wanted to turn right at that intersection, you're giving them enough room to make that turn to that intersection. Um, the second image on the right hand, it doesn't have the stop sign there, but that's the instance where there's a crosswalk, right? You can't park in that crosswalk and you still need to give a five meter distance. So um, we talk about the rule of five because there's another situation here um, where you cannot park within five meters of a fire hydrant. So the rule of five basically means that in a lot of situations, you cannot park within five meters of a fire hydrant, five meters of a crosswalk, five meters of a stop sign or a yield sign, um, 1.5 meters um, from a driveway and 50 centimeters from the curb. So this is where that rule of thumb might come in really handy for you when you're doing your knowledge test. You, you're likely going to get asked a question somewhere about parking. About And so within that parking, they may ask you, um, how far are you, must you stay away from a fire hydrant? And they'll give you a certain amount of options like 10 cent or 10 meters, two meters, five meters, six meters, you want to generally default to the five meters because as we just went over this chapter, there's a lot of instances where that rule five or those five meters is a common um, reoccurrence. So now we're done chapter three and I'm going to get you guys to do the quiz. Um, so I'll pop it in the chat there for you. It's here. Um, is the link uh, or the quick response code if you're using it on your phone, but I'll put it in the chat here for you too.